Hey. Hello everyone, welcome again to another PD Chat uh, with your panel uh, for this evening again is uh, Rob Bryan and Pete Cater, give us a wave guys, there they are, and also our special guest for tonight, Miss Daisy Palmer, thank you for coming Daisy. Yeah, thanks for having me. Good. Um, so, first of all, um, people out there watching, uh, if you can't connect, I've got some loads of stuff I've got behind the scenes going on here. Um, we're obviously live on Facebook. Go to the uh, Palace Drum Clinic page uh, and literally go there, um, sign in, say hello, we'll give you a wave and everything else. Um, and you can also um, so write any messages um, in the comment box, uh, questions um, or any suggestions that you'd like us to talk about. Um, so um, anything like that. So um, first of all, um, thank you very much guys for coming again. Um, thank you Daisy for being our guest. Um, what I'd like to talk about so, uh, this evening um, is that as drummers, we all got to like you know um, we're all individual people. Um, but how come it these, these days it doesn't seem to be a massive individuality um, in in music? Sometimes you obviously replicate like you know sort of tribute acts and stuff like that. So I want to talk to, uh, this evening about how do we actually find our own identity, our own sound uh, in this modern age where we can only well, well, we can not only basically we can basically go to the computer and watch anything basically throughout our, our history, especially on, on the drum kit. So, um, how 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 do basically we find our own sound? So, Daisy, um, being um, being being it's like a, a but people don't know Daisy. So she plays uh, uh, well currently uh, with Promoter Faith um, um, amongst uh, her own bands as well. Um, but you, you you love your vintage, you love your modern, but you also electronics as well. And you generally you know you put the two together. So how did you create your own sound? Because obviously it doesn't. You don't wake up one night going, do you know what? That's my setup, is it? So <laughs> no, it takes years and years. Yeah. To sort that out. Um, it's a matter of sort of taste. I found. Um, my taste changed over the years and for what I liked, the music that I liked and the sounds that I wanted to make. And um, eventually I arrived where I am now, which is vintage drums, um, an array of sort of new and old cymbals and um, uh, quite, quite intense uh, integrated um, triggers um, around the kit. So yeah that's that's it really but it did take me a hell of a long time to get there because i was a jazz drummer to start off with so i was using smaller drums and uh loads of cymbals <laughs> for some reason things that hit you know then you realize you can play fast so you just go Rah! um which uh, just isn't my style at all now um i have big drums three cymbals that's it right so so obviously so how, how did you um how did you literally get into the kind of i want to put that trigger there i want to have that instead of that kind of thing and all that is it literally because of the music you was playing or was it your own creativity you went like you know guys i've been playing around this do you think it'll work you know with what we're trying to do so so, so forth hmm. yeah it came from it came from the pop the pop world really so i the, the gig that i had with golf rap um we started to use triggers and um uh all of that within within the sound world of, of of that band and then you'd either have like uh, a sample and an acoustic sound or you'd have the external sound um external triggers doing the samples so you'd have a bit of both and then within that you would work out the part you know where it kicks off and how it's going and and then that sort of has moved, moved into what i do with Mesodorm and uh, my bands now um, and yeah it's all it's all hybrid now really um, the Paloma show I set up myself as well so that's just exactly how how I want it which is really cool um, again just acoustic triggers kick and snare and then all all your external stuff and SPD SX fantastic so um, coming to you Pete um, you are well, you're known primarily as like you know it's, it's one of the country leading jazz players um now in the world of jazz obviously you know there's many many avenues that you possibly can take so how do we know you know because we do know and it's i think it's a fantastic thing so we do know when pete kate is playing because we we know we know that your style of playing but how did you get it from amongst of abundance of people and also that the history that basically the instrument basically was laid out for us well jazz was going to have an advantage because we've got more to listen to 
we've got a whole century of recorded music to uh, to draw upon. And I said this on one of my on my uh, video blog um, yesterday or the day before, uh, because the 20th century was documented in a way like no other century uh, previous thereto by dint of moving pictures and recorded sound. And it so happens that as that was all coming together at late 19 teens, early 1920s, that's exactly when jazz was getting started. That's when the drum set was getting started. So as a jazz musician, you are, have an embarrassment of riches. You have a whole century of music that you can listen to. Mm. And every time you listen to somebody new who you never heard before, you take something else. You take something more. And this is why I am very diverse in my listening tastes. And, and most people probably think I just listen to Buddy Rich all the time. <laughs> uh, and nothing, truthfully, nothing could be further from the truth. Um, I, I, the, the reality is that, that I just like to hear music and drums in all kinds of different contexts. Not that I'm going to suddenly have this sort of midlife crisis change of direction. And I've seen, I remember when I was a bit younger, seeing one or two of the drummers who I really admired, who were probably about the age that I am now, suddenly going off having, as I say, like a midlife crisis, like a, like, like a young girlfriend in a sports car. Mm. In the way that they played, they suddenly turned everything on its head and, and started to do something different. Uh, I try to assimilate new stuff, but I'm still basically the same player, uh, fundamentally, that I was when I was like 17, 18, 19 years old. I'm just adding new layers all the time, and rather than kind of tearing everything down and starting all over again. Uh, and, and that, to me, I think is um, reflects what the, 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 the lifelong learning process. You know, I'm, I'm, mm. I'm looking to be influenced all the time. I've, I've been listening to stuff over the last couple of days that I that is half forgotten, and, you know, drummers that I've hardly heard. And 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 it's all it, it all adds. It all adds. Nothing takes away. It all adds. But I think having a a sense of who you are. From the outset, is, 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 is I think a positive thing. I mean, you know, when I was in the early 1980s, when I was in my late teens, I wanted to be the kind of drummer that I am now. However, that wasn't really viable because there was a, a, no real career path to be that kind of player back then. In, in fact, probably the opportunities are greater now uh, than they were back then, strange as that may seem. And it, it was so. It was the case that in order to be a professional player and get out of my little local comfort zone in the West Midlands, I had to expand my skill set massively, and that meant listening to a lot of different music and a lot of different players. But it wasn't like I sort of suddenly cast aside everything that I'd done up to that point. I just added another layer and another layer, and, and, and I still do. Mm. Fantastic. So, Rob. Yeah. Again, uh, very much jazzy kind of background, but you, you, you played with, well, it, like, like Peter, you, you played with so many different slight varieties of music. Um, you know, how, how do you know Rob, Rob Bryan's behind the kit then? <laughs> I don't know when I am behind the kit sometimes. <laughs> um, well, the thing is for me, as you say, I was brought up, my dad was a jazz drummer and he brought me up on the jazz stuff. Um, but I was 10 or 11 in 1980. <laughs> So I was a child of the 80s and the Lindrum and people like Prince and people came up and sort of bit me on the bottom and said, there's other ways of making drum sounds than, than, than just playing on a live kit. So I spent three or four years up to about, I don't know, maybe 84, 85, trying to find something that would sound on my drum kit like a Lindrum. I wanted yeah. that print and I wanted those sounds and I couldn't create them. So I, I went on this sideline of learning all my rudiments and all the drummy stuff, but trying to find this electronic sound. Um, and then Elise just made a drum machine that was reasonably affordable about 1987, 88. And I managed to get one of those from a local music shop. And then they started to meet. And um, I started to sort of mess about with this sort of hybrid thing in a low budget form way, way back. Um, and I think what I've always done is that I've got a massive love of electronic stuff. Um, and then it was drum and bass and all that kind of things. Then I bought triggers and then I started working with Susie Sue 
Um, and that was a bit of both. That was like acoustic drums, triggers, loops and everything, playing to clicks and stuff and having the old in-ears. Um, and I kind of fell into that. And then I'd go into a different project where there's no electronics at all. And they'd say, we want a, a 60s kit. So I'd bring out the old super classic Ludwig and use that for a while. Then I'd go back to the sonal stuff that I was using at the time. So for me, um, I'm always kind of, I'm a sort of hybrid of, generally, I'm just messing around with it all of the time. And I still do drum clinics with my Lynn drum. I still take it out. Sometimes she works, sometimes she doesn't. Yeah. But I have my SPDSX and triggers there. And sometimes my Lynn, as I say, she'll turn on or sometimes there'll be a puff of smoke and it's like, oh, well, I'll have to do it without it tonight. You know? But I certainly wouldn't tour with it. Um, but other times I'll turn up with my little 18 inch jazz kit and equally play and I'm, I'm very happy. So to be honest with you, I think my sound's a movable feast. I like it to be different. For, I wouldn't turn up to a project personally and say, this is this is my thing. I'm happy, like with Lorena now, I'm not using any triggers. I've got a Roland pad, actually. I'm using a few loops, but I'm not on click or anything. It's, it's quite nice. So for me, that's why I say I don't know what's behind the kit, because I'm moving all the time in taking the house to do a different thing and I'm, I'm quite happy with that i quite like it if i know it's on the grid all the time i'm happy and i'll bolt down with what i need and other times if it's off the grid i'm quite happy with that too but when i'm in that situation you know you, we all all of us here we own that situation with what we bring um, otherwise we wouldn't be sat on the stool doing it at that time so i think we all come you know, with what the, or everything we need. And if the artist says, I don't want that, you go, yeah, that's fine. And you yeah. can still produce the good. So um, as I say, for me, it's a, it's a bit of a movable feast really, but um, hopefully when I'm on the kit doing whatever I'm doing, that's where people know it's me playing the drums. Yeah, well, well, well yeah, great. Well, we, we definitely know you're playing the drums when you're playing. Um, so, <laughs> yeah. so we've got um, a few, few shouts out. Obviously, we've got lots of people watching. Uh, Dave Patrick, um, hello, Dave. Um, he says, evening all. Uh, Mike Tubbins here again. Hello, folks. Um, Kenneth Everett is a uh, high listen again. He loves this idea, which is obviously we'll keep going with it. No problems. Uh, um, as long as you're watching, we'll still do it. And a couple of other people watching. So, uh, guys watching at home, um, send us your, your questions or any kind of comments and stuff like that. We're here to answer, um, you know, anything that you put up, drumming or music-wise. Obviously, not about, you know, it's like where do I get the nearest barber or anything like that. Because of <laughs> my bar and it, it's not going to, it's not around here. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so. Um, we also we talk about like you know the influence and everything else on that, but is um, hi Martin, Martin Ollie, hi. Um, is we with all you know with all that kind of like you know, our, our teachers, you know, if you've been down the teaching route and that kind of stuff, uh, we have all influences. But um, our taste in music obviously influences. Um, would we would we say um, throughout the ages uh, is gear? Uh, it's like a factor in it's like you know creating a sound because obviously you know back in the day basically everyone basically just like played on you know just a few different sizes but obviously now it's like you know coming into stuff you know you can create so many many wonderful not necessarily talking about so electronics but many wonderful sounds uh on the drum kit nowadays um rob i know for you for certain so you in the studio you've just got some different plastic drum heads you've cut and you know you've got mm. different snare and all that kind of stuff um when when i watch Heat play um you you don't necessarily have a basic hit but you seem to actually be able to change your sound uh from when you saw you're playing a jazz or to a sort of funk kind of thing uh and then obviously you know daisy when, when you're doing your you know your hybrid stuff really you know you just you know is she actually playing a snare drum or is that just you, know I mean? you, you just don't know so do, do we find gear a factor in it's like uh you know everybody's kind of sound or was it because of gear we're basically almost going down the same kind of uh, I, I don't know, um, so, uh, trend, I suppose. What do you reckon? Um, uh, well, well I, I think, um, thank God the companies make this stuff. Yeah. Um, and we, and, and not every one person uses it the same way, I mm. think. And I think that's where the genius comes. It, it's like when you put a, a ride symbol up and you get, say the three of us, or the, you know, well, four of us, including me, of course. But the four of us were in a music shop and we went up to play a ride cymbal or a snare drum, right? And someone said, I'm not going to tell you what to play. Just play that cymbal, play that drum. The, the four of us and millions of other drummers in the world would play it differently every time. Yeah, and, I, 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 and I think that's what it comes down to. 
you know, it's how we individually use it because all the products have been out there for years and um, it's what we do with it, I think. Yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, a bit of a lost word, which is touch. I remember yeah. back in, in, the, in the old days when I was getting started, with the, big, the big drummers of the day who I really looked up to, they would always talk about how was your touch on the instrument, about, about the sound that you actually create, about the moment mm. that the stick makes contact with the brain surface and, and the result of the sound that comes from that. And um, I think we may have, we may be looking more towards the gear that we acquire or seek to acquire, rather than thinking about how we as individual musicians uh, actually adapt that gear to create our sound. In fact, if ever I get a new set of drums, um, it can often take months before they actually sound right. Yeah, yeah. And, and I hear when, this this is uh, you know product from coming up, but when I when I got the first set of British Drum Company drums, which I needed in very short order because I was about to start filming my DVD the day after, um, they were out straight out of the box. They they sounded and felt right, and I think I don't remember when I got my DW drums back in 2002. For for six months they felt really alien. They they and, and it, it, I, I, it was almost like I had to play myself into the instrument it's mm -hmm. like we had to you know i had to get to know the drums and the drums had to get to know me before they would start to behave in the way that what i was doing to them would produce the actual sounds that i wanted yeah that's why i like the older drums because there's all the work's been done yeah yeah they they, they have history they've, mm. uh, they've got they've got you know, you know high mileage drum set yeah, yeah. Well, actually, just, just leading on that, Daisy, um, we've got a question. So, uh, hi, Ga uh, get Gary Davis on. Hi, folks. Um, Mike's actually asked, uh, he'd like to ask, what is the attraction to the vintage gear, especially hardware, because it's so flimsy? Now, uh, <laughs> hi, Aaron. Uh, hi, Aaron. Backache. Uh, He's broken. Lifting <laughs> uh, it upstairs. <laughs> look, at, look, look at look at you know John Bonham never used anything heavier than a Ludwig Atlas, which is single brace or single brace tripod stands, um, and and you know that for a, a big hitter like Bonham, that was enough. And, yeah. And you know, I, I went I went through a phase actually in the early two thousands when I was um, doing a lot of uh, gigs with Matthew Herbert. We were doing like lots of hit and run festivals all over Europe and further afield. And I would just take symbols, and I'd turn up to these various you know, sites, venues, you know, fields, whatever, and the, the hire kit would be there, and it would always have really, really heavy-duty hardware. And I'd put my ride symbol on this massive um, triple bass boom cymbal stand. And it's like, <laughs> why is this symbol not behaving like it? Like those clothes. But yeah, I'm used yeah. to putting it on a lightweight stand at home, and you put mm. it on this great big heavy thing, which is yeah, yeah. anchored to the ground, and, mm. and it kind of sucks the life out of your cymbals. And yeah, yeah. I found yeah. the famous snare drum stands as well. They're heavy snare drum stands. Mm -hmm. Really, they kind of they say they suck the life out of the instruments. Mm -hmm. That's why I like I like the lightweight stuff, I, 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 as well as the obvious um, consideration of being quite an old person. <laughs> I don't want to pick up too much. I don't want to pick oh, up too no. much. No. No, you're not. Yeah, you're no, looking, not true. You're looking well, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Well, the thing is, uh, oh, hi, Aaron. Uh, how are you guys? We're all good. Thank you very much. Um, it, well, 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 for me, it's like, you know, obviously, you know, Daisy hit the nail on the head. So, like, you know, the work is already done with sound wise with the older drums, obviously. You know, I've got. Um, well, Daisy, you played on my Gretsch round badge. That's um, beautiful. You know, and it's just like, and people do comments like, you know, that's just like the greatest bass drum sound. You can, well, yeah, until Daisy messed about with it, but it's fine. <laughs> uh, but it's um, it's one of those things where the drums, obviously, they're just going to get like better and better and better with with age. You know, they're they're, they're less like a, a, a good piece of furniture or sort of fine wine. You know, obviously, they, they do have their limitations. Obviously, you want to drink the wine at a certain point. Um, yeah. But you know, it's, it's it's you know, it's all that kind of stuff. And obviously, you know, the different modern heads. You know, they're getting out slightly better ones to try and replicate of old, as like of the cast and all that. But but the hardware. Um, you know, I, I think I had a chat with you many years about this. It's like, you know, why do, why do we like the hardware? Well, things the hardware, for, well, for me at the time, is what that basic kit was, you know, all about. 
So, yeah, things, you know, especially sort of rail consulates, you know, they, they don't tighten up so you have to ram your snare drum and obviously, you know, protect your, you know, protect your snares and your shells. But yeah. it's that kind of, then you adapt because that is, that's the drums. If you don't want something that's going to move and be solid, then, then that's, that's the modern hardware for you and the modern kind of drums. But yeah. it, it, it does give you that kind of, I suppose, romance about sort of how you know how these guys were actually playing on back back in the day, wouldn't it? Really, I suppose that's what I'm trying mm. to say. So you cope with the with the stands. I think. Well, for me, um, what I've actually done with my vintage gear, I've actually got the um, uh, Gibraltar's like eight eight thousand series, which is the flat base, very flimsy flat base. But you know, they do wobble like the old ones. But you never know. You know, they're not going to go anywhere. Um, but it looks, it's, it's 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 how the sound still travels through. Yeah, that's yeah. Really yeah. That's the yeah. point. Yeah, so hopefully, um, can can you remember that conversation, Rob, we had about that kind of? Yeah, yeah. I can. I mean, I use all, uh, when I'm gigging locally, I just use all the um, DW flat bass stands, whatever range, yeah. six thousand or whatever range yeah. I have. I, yeah, I'm I'm I use the seven thousands. I don't like the nine thousands. If they ever say I'm going to speak to the nine thousands, I say no. I don't want nine thousands. They're just like, like you say, they suck the life out of cymbals, yeah. out of the snare drum. I just give me the sevens, and they're like, "Are you sure?" I'm like, "Yes, yeah. I love that range. Single brace stands will work." You know, I don't want the big double ones. I'm I'm not playing a loud gig at the moment. I don't need people to be over tightening. Mm. You know, but but at the same time, I mean, with the vintage thing, I'm a massive vintage fan, but I've also bought some vintage kids that have been absolute not great, yeah. not round, and they've yeah. been hard to tune. You know, and I've been in this, I've, actually, I've still got one. My Ludwig Super Classic, the 22 is ace, the Jazz Festival is ace, 16, 18 inch floor toms, ace, the 13 inch rack tom is a dog, you know. So, what, what you know, year is it? Re, you know, re, uh, what's the name, the bearing edge, get it redone. Because in the studio, it'll go doom. And it'll go doom anywhere in between to get it. So when I record with it, I usually have that Ludwig kit with a, either a 13 or a 12 inch DW that will tune anywhere I want it to. Um, but I guess you could say you would try it first. But I bought that in the States um, and I didn't have time to play into it before I had it sent back. So um, sometimes it's a kind of a hit and miss, you know. But I would say to people, try your kit out before you buy it. Yeah. Is that kind of bit me on the bottom a little bit? <laughs> but the Rogers well, I bought is fantastic. Yeah. Um, the Rogers I had is unbelievable. Um, and well, all the snare drums I've ever bought have been un unreal. Yeah. Because the quality con control kind of fell off a bit with Ludwig in the mid 60s because the demand got so high. Yeah, Ringo. Um, Ringo. Yeah. Damn you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, the, the, only, the, only, the only complete <laughs> turkey I've ever had, the only big turkey drum I've ever had was when, when I, I had a, a very, very minor, very small uh, artist deal with Slingerland when I was, uh, how many years ago? Nearly 40 years ago. Uh, and the snare drum that came with the drum set uh, was a 5x14 10 lug wood shell. And you could not put a head on it. You had to uh, uh, wrench the head on and off the drum. It was so, I mean, it was, it was like, it's, 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 the snare drum was like an ellipse or something. It was just so <laughs> not right. It wouldn't tune. It wouldn't play. Um, so oh. I, I, that, uh, that got put away <laughs> and sold eventually. There's, there's another another question on this, but I just I'm just going to ask in. Uh, Rob, there's this from Elliot Scott said maybe a mug for egg shaped heads. I think Trixon's got that one already sewn in the bag. Yeah. Nailed it. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's. Um, yeah, Aaron Gull, uh, uh, any advice on being a pro drummer? Aaron, last week we actually talked about actually what makes a good drummer, and there's a lot of good comments um, and advice actually on that one. You can find it on, on YouTube on, on my on my site, so YouTube site, mail, mail at mattgreen.org.uk, or obviously reverb it actually in, in the Palace Drum Clinic uh, page. So have a look at that one, because that was a very, very good one, because was, someone was actually asking that question, and we've spent a lot of time on that. So... Have a look at that, uh, that one, and we can do that. Um, but um, Kenneth has actually asked, let me just find it again. Um, he said, I've now discovered aquarium vintage heads for brushes. Most of the other servers comes off, but what heads do you always use and why? And he said he's finding code very good. Now, I, I, think, we're, I think we're all in the same situation. Um, I think we're all remote people, aren't we? Yeah, yeah but I like those. Did you see that kangaroo skin I had? Yes, yeah. 
They're really good. Oh, was, yeah. that, was that one of Martin, Martin Oldham's? Yeah, Martin. Yeah, Martin's my mate. He lives around the corner from me. Uh, but I get all my vintage stuff from him, so I always. Yeah, well, know. He's the he is the go-to guy. <laughs> but he's great, and uh, yeah, he's he's the distributor for Kentville here, isn't he? So he's always trying to yeah. get play them. But now I've got I've got I've got them on my Ludwig, um, the thirteen sixty on the Super Classic, seventy six, and and on the Snare, which is a, a late seventies Superphonic deep one, and like having those on all of the drums is just yeah so good yeah well, but well me, it's, it's remo vintage well for me on, on my if so the kits i generally do so the brushes on um i have i'm quite um i'm quite a sort of tone so, so i've got something quite thick but i like the batters of the dryness of it so i've got sort of an Imper X on the snare drum um but my on my other snare drums uh, i find that the p77 for me um, I was a bit worried about it because it's got the because um, I, I don't like to dampen my snare. I like to ring, but it's so some of the drums uh, that I've got them on. They're very lively, so you get that sort of high tone ring. And obviously, with this kind of so it's based on sort of the, the Power Stroke Three with the internal yeah. ring. Uh, it's got a spot on the top, and like the centre spot obviously is underneath. And I was very very worried about actually sort of playing brushes. The brush goes over so lovely, and it's got that kind of I don't know. It gives you that little bit extra. So for me, my personal thing, the P seventy sevens, I I actually love uh, for many reasons. You can tune them up, you can tune them down. You've got a nice kind of surface on it for brushes. Um, but yeah, that that's my personal thing. Uh, but Pete, what's your um, what's your preference? I, you know, I I I, I come and go with, uh, with 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 different options, but I, I keep coming back to a fiber skin diplomat. Um, just because it makes such a, it's a great, obviously a great head for brushes. That it was probably the first uh, plastic head that really got close to uh, playing like a calf head would, without obviously the the inherent problems of uh, you know, changing uh, climate. And and it just makes such a damn good sound. <laughs> and it, you can tune it high, you can tune it low. I mean. Well, I, I like it in the easy life. I have, I think the um, the snare that you know, obviously we're not gigging at the moment, but the snare that I was using most frequently, I had put a fiber skin on quite recently. Uh, everything else has got coated ambassadors on, and I tune them up, I tune them down. Maybe put a moon gel on each tom and one on the bass drum, occasionally one on the snare drum, if I'm setting. You know, if the drums are settling in a lower register according to the music that's going to be played, but really it's the same stuff all the time. It's just single ply coated heads. Um, I mean, I am in some ways the the companies really like me because I'm I'm so low maintenance, <laughs> but I, I'm not trying all the latest stuff out and saying, "Hey, check this out." You know, I kind of know where I am, and uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I don't feel the need to be. Um, Constantly chopping and changing. Yeah. I really don't. Nice. Rob, Rob, anything at all? Or is um, it? I, 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 it depends on what I'm doing, what the project is, um, and I'll change them up as as needed. But if if someone said you've got a drum kit there, you've got a choice of heads, I'll do probably um, Ambassador, uh, white coated on the toms, or Emperor, depending on the sound I wanted. Um, and on the snare drum, CS Batter. Um, or just good old fashioned ambassador coated. I love them because then they see the moon gel or different plastic things on the top yeah. to change the sound. Um, I kind of like the, you know, if someone come up and said, you know, that sound you, you're trying to get with those plastic things is ahead. That would be boring to me because then two seconds later, I'd want to get my other sound back or, or change it up. Mm -hmm. so I'd have to unscrew it or get a tech to put another snare on. I like the fact that it's all hands on. Mm -hmm. I'm kind of old school. <laughs> if I want something to happen, I want to make it happen. Yeah, yeah. definitely. You know what I mean? Then it is it. it. And I also love the people's faces when you do that. You know, I think I told you that story when I had the douche snare, you know, when I was recording that track and the producer ran down and said, What's that? You know, and I said, Well, it's the same drum, but I've just put these two plastic heads on it. He was like, Oh my God, I'm taking that. And, I, and at that point, Charlie Jones, who I know you know, David. Yeah, I love Charlie. He said you should charge for that, and he went back upstairs. And I was thinking, yeah, I should, but did I? Nah. No, of course I didn't. <laughs> so Coldplay have probably got that snare drum all over their new album yeah, now. Yeah, of course they have. Yeah. Whatever. <laughs> uh, Martin, Martin, Ollie's he's saying um, that he has to re remember his dad putting his snare drum in the airing cupboard before gig to stretch the calf heads. Oh, brilliant! 
Yeah. Now, now I um a lot of people know me, so if you know, I do a lot of classical. But um, one of my major classical things is uh, period period uh, performance. So actually, I play on very small timpani. So I do a lot of like Bach, Handel, Mozart, um, Beethoven's most probably the latest kind of thing, Haydn. Uh, uh, so you know all the earlier stuff. So Christmas, you'll see me in quite many cathedrals playing Handel's Messiah. Yeah. So, so yeah. there we are. But I, I actually do and. Talking about that, it's it's a funny one because obviously they're they they're, they're called this like the tap timps. You basically you got your hand tune them. Um, very very hard to actually stay in tune. It all depends on atmosphere. Dry day is fantastic. If you get a little bit of dampness and all that, so they go up and down all the time. I literally tune them, and two seconds later you go, oh dear, I'm not in tune with anyone. <laughs> um, but I find uh, yes, I, I have to put my hands on them. You know, constantly it keeps me awake as well, um, <laughs> which is always a good thing, isn't it? Um, so so carpet. I love playing on carpets. I really do. So I played on the kangaroo. I had to try on the kangaroo, and I was thinking, oh great, fantastic. Um, but it's uh, for me. If if I could actually on my own timps, actually, I'm. It's no point doing it now. Um, but I'd actually go to goat. Has anyone actually played on goat skin? No. Baron. No. Yeah, as I say, with the with the with the, with the baron, it's um, it's got that slightly thicker, big tone. And yeah. I'm wondering if um, well, if anyone's out there, have they actually tried goat skin on on their snares? Because I, I, or even to be honest, I think it mostly work really good on like larger toms as well. Mm. Yeah, the vellum is very thick. Yeah, it would yeah. be quite thick on big, some toms. Big tone, big tone, and obviously very hard wearing. Um, so uh, hi, Mark Jeffs is watching. Well, he knows all about uh, he does big stuff. He does. He does um, George Prentice put, is to say, any advice for them to transcriptions after learning them properly? How can I take it further? And what is played on the record? Well, I suppose this is almost like going into like kind of what we've been saying at the beginning, it's like how to create your sound, isn't it? Transcriptions. Um, well. Um, well, it's, it's, it's a hard one because obviously this is a whole section on itself. Um, I suppose, um, I suppose, uh, well, I can open it to any of you guys. So obviously you have to, what's to say, Daisy, you've obviously had to learn Paloma stuff um, and then go out on tour. Rob, exactly the same. Pete, exactly the same. You know, we're all exactly the same. We have to learn stuff and then go out. So it's, I suppose, if I basically give this little stab in the dark, please come in with anything. It's like... We, we did hit on this last week. It's, it's a matter of basically listening and listening and actually just like writing your own stuff down. If you can read it, you're going to have an advantage over everything. Uh, speed is learning and all that kind of stuff. So it's not necessarily dictating every single note if you don't that, but in your own kind of language, you know, the structure and everything else. Uh, which I say, you know, um, George, have a look at the last week's. Uh, we did hit on that quite a lot, but um, I think we're all in greens with that really, aren't we, for the transcription stuff and how to learn it quickly because... I'm not being funny. You can get called for a gig. Uh, so, are you free next week? Yeah, here's the set list, and maybe you've got to learn 50 songs if you don't know them already. So, how are you going to do that? You know, within a week. You know, so yeah, <clears throat> yeah, yeah definitely. So there we are. But, uh, this is all good. Um, I'm not going to really respond to Mike Tuppence because he keeps saying about you know, can you catch your sticks off in your pouch on the kangaroo skins and stuff like that. <laughs> um, yes. Well, he, he, <laughs> Mike, 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 Mike is a Mike is a renowned master of wit and epigram. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> as, as, as anybody who knows him will attest. Um, Martin also says Martin Ollie's like uh, he still uses his Hercules hardware with his bloody super, super classic. Nice. Her Hercules was some of the best designed hardware ever. Yeah, uh, because it was sturdy, uh, but it, because it was tubular, it was light. And I've got some over there, but not not that you can see in the shop. But I've still got my Hercules stance from the 1980s, and and it was some of the best thought out hardware there ever was because yeah. it it had the stability but without the weight. Yeah, yeah. Ah. Let's just bring it back. Yeah, it was really. Oh, yeah. Yeah, but, but would it be the same, like? Hmm? Would it be the same if we actually, if they um, reissued it? Because obviously, alloys will probably be different. You know, the comp composite would be different. They might be using different. Would it actually be the same, do you think, if they did bring it back? Who knows? They, they you know, they're using some of the lightweight, uh, you know, as you say, alloys that are around today. They could really have a hit on their hands if they, if they thought, it, thought it through. Uh, the tubular uh, bases, and with, with, which gives so much stability, uh, but with, without without the weight issue, yeah, the the originals were great. I'm still very fond of them. Yeah. Um, 
Is there anything in in your uh, Daisy and Rob and in your setup that basically you just like is is a go to kind of vin not I'm not talking about drums but a go to vintage kind of piece of hardware because obviously there's been lots of talk about that tonight. Is there, is there a go to one just like oh I ha you know, I, that has to be in my you know my bag or something else like I have to be on it because for me it is my WFL speaking. Oh. And I'm so sorry, Daisy. I didn't, you know, you brought your own pedal when you came to the clinic, um, and I said, "Oh yeah, I got this one." It's actually, you know, we figured out because it's got Kirk scribbling on it, like Simon Kirk was uh, old on as well. So yeah, I love that pedal. I wanted it. Yeah, so yeah, um, I don't actually have. I don't actually have an old pedal, or all my hard, old hardware is um, deceased. Deceased. It's gone. Now, to so the, I just have the new, the new stuff, in the like, sky, yeah. like the old stuff, you know. Um, yeah. But I do have, still have the spindly cymbal stand for my uh, Super Classic and the one that goes on the Beverly as well. Do you know what I, I mean? The one that goes on yeah. to the, yeah. the, the bass drum. I love that. So you can't, you can't actually use that if that, if that kid is in, in, in use then? Yeah, I do use yeah. that. Yeah. It looks wicked as well. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They do. They do. So good. Um, anything, Rob, from you? Um, I, I tend not to gig my vintage fans. I like them to be for little local jazz gigs. I, I certainly wouldn't take them out on bigger events. Um, I do like looking down and seeing an old Ludwig hi hat stand. I've got from that drum kit I had sent over from the States, the 68 Super Classic. I've got the hi hat stand and I've got a, a WFL Speed King as well. Um, but it's just so noisy and stuff. I can't really use it and yeah. jingles and squeaks. I love it for that if I'm about at home, but yeah. I certainly wouldn't take it anywhere. But, but actually, I was in the shed today and I found it, and I just, I just give it a little rocking motion there, and I thought, oh, I quite like you, but I just know I can't, I can't use it. But yeah. I do, I do love to look at them. I love to collect them. I'm an anorak. I do love to see those old stands, but I'm always a bit scared to use them these days. Mm -hmm. uh, a very important gig because I know they probably wouldn't always deliver. <laughs> but I just like having them. I think I, I, I tinker with mine. Yeah, I tinker with mine with the speaking. Obviously, it's notorious for the squeak. Yes. Yeah. Apart from squeak. new ones, apparently. Apart from new ones, well, I'd love to see I one. Want to try a new one. Um, oh, Tom, Tom Bradley's watching. Hi, Tom. Hi, Tom. Uh, Hi, Tom. Who was on last week? Um, okay, Elliot. Elliot Scott. This one's for Daisy. So, Daisy, I've seen you a few times on uh, in the Bristol scene. Uh, and you seem to be one with the band's personality from performing perspective. Uh, you also played with some very different acts. How do you approach the diversity of styles? Um, I don't really know. I think it's just about, for me, it was just about just getting into that band, listening to them, listening to their influences, um, and then just sort of, going from there really just really getting involved in in what they're trying to do and then my the bands that i'm in now my bands are very sort of eclectic and i think i've just taken loads of different types of things from everywhere and just made a not not really really a unique thing but it's sort of it's very different to to everything that came before when i was playing um, but yeah, I mean, I just, I always played from very young. I always played all of the different styles and I found that that really helped as a jobbing musician, really. Mm. People just yeah. can see that you can play lots of stuff and they're like, want to do this? I was like, wicked. But Bristol was very good for that because everyone's doing all sorts, like, and people are doing, uh, make a band that's like, just sits in between stuff that you're, that you are familiar with and then you could sort of really roll with that and sort of make that your own a bit and uh it might not fall in, in into any genre category um but it's fucking cool and people like that and yeah it's just yeah. It's just it's a melting pot really but still isn't it rob it is and I, I found the same thing and i think if you you enjoy different styles of music you'll get a lot of work mm. in that sort of creative environment mm. because everyone they're all bringing different things in to the pot yeah. and they just mix together don't they and yeah. you know and uh, some guy might come in on the gig and say i'm more of a jazzer you know and it could be a different kind of gig yeah. you know, it's going to be cool it's going to be great and they go up there and they play and it 
it just happens and I just mm. I just love that and I think that's what to me that's what music's all about and that's yeah. what my favorite artists and drummers have always done they've they've, mm. they've been that 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 person that, that creative melting pot to make mm. things happen and I think yeah, yeah completely agree with you. that's how it should be and mm. I think you bring a personality into that and everything just sort of comes together mm. yeah for me a band is just it's just some mates playing some music and then everyone has their own little style and then you write a song together and then you'll put your own little stamp on it and you've made something new and different and it's yeah. that's what it is that's that's why i do it mm. i think mm. yeah. Um, just had a comeback about my speaking. Uh, Martin, uh, on his face, uh, he, when he uses his speaking, he puts a bottle of DW40 in his case. Now, <laughs> yeah, I actually don't carry one with my Martin because I've, uh, I've done something to it and I'm not going to give my secret out. I know what it is. <laughs> <laughs> shush, shush. <laughs> How's he done to it? <laughs> oh, I know what he's done to it. It's, it's, it's sneaky, isn't it? Very sneaky, but it works so well. It, it so does. Well. It's, a, it's a lovely pedal of yours. Yeah, it's nice. Yeah. Um, so, so that. Um, yeah, no, it was a fantastic so, um, interaction. Thanks very much, guys. Um, remember, if you obviously watch the. Uh, no, I'm not telling you, Martin. No, no. It's a, personally, you can do it. Otherwise, I'll, you know, I'll be out of work, won't I? Fix and speak. Well, I don't anyway. Um, well, I could do now. I could start make money out of it on yeah, this yeah. Send it to me, I'll fix them for you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, uh, yeah so we've had a lot of fantastic questions. Um, this is like, um, just just to cover, it's like, um, there's this couple of ones that's like, you know, uh, obviously towards our guests, because obviously yeah. yourself, uh, Rob and Peter, the, 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 you know, the furniture within the <laughs> Palace John Clinic now. Um, Absolutely. It's like, um, he's asking how do you obviously get the big gigs and so I'd love to know you know he's drumming every day and I'm gonna say, you know he's trying to learn different stuff and as just as I say it's you know as we discussed last week and I think all of you agree and, and Pete's answer last week is actually fantastic it's 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 the networking and always make sure you're prepared for you know the next gig and you I suppose you're only as good as the the previous gig um so you have to make sure but it's just the networking so if you know your stuff you know you, you'll get there you get there. It may not happen tomorrow. It may not happen next year. Um, it may not happen in ten years' time. But all of a sudden, if you basically persevere with it, get up and just keep doing it. Yeah, yeah. you've got to be in it for the long haul. You've got to really have to be in it for the long haul. I mean, I, I didn't get noticed by, and I, whilst I always worked through through my entire adult life, adult, um, I didn't really get come to the attention of the drum industry until I was well down my forties. And uh, you know, you have to keep chipping away and keep improving just just for the love of playing and and I, I, for, for a lot of my life I a lot of the work that I did which was you know very commercial oriented you know lots of freelancing there was a lot of music there that I didn't particularly enjoy playing but I looked at it as like a way of if you like subsidizing that thing that I had in the background that was my little special side project that eventually became the thing for which I became best known. And and the, the you know the array of freelance work coming from all sorts of different directions uh, was the means by which I was able to keep my personal projects on the back burner and then when the time came bring them to the fore and uh, and actually do something. Yeah, yeah. It's it's I suppose it's um all these kind of subjects, you know, is, we can't really sort of discuss it within the amount of time we have. You know, if, if we was online, you know, twenty four seven, obviously we haven't deep talked. But um, we had a lot of discussion about these kind of things um, actually at our Palace Drum Camp, uh, which happened on uh, uh, in February. Uh, which uh, fingers crossed, it's going to be happening again this February. Uh, yeah, put it in your diaries now, guys. Palace Drum Camp. <laughs> and, oh, it, yeah. and it's it's one of the things that that is most probably. First of all, that's your first connection, isn't it? Uh, you're networking straight away because obviously you're with people, you know, there, you know, who actually are doing, you know, what you're doing. Even if you're just there, it's, it's like an amateur basically. You just want to, you know, come and see, you know, learn, you know, be inspired. Basically, you know, you're stuck in a rut and all that kind of stuff. Obviously, great curry, uh, great entertainment, and you know, Pete keeps piping on about this. It's the best camp that's got the best biscuits. Yeah, uh, got the it does. It does. Yeah, um, so. and and and, uh, and and a little bit of genius in the organisation that I haven't seen at another drum camp. So so there no, we are. Nobody, so. nobody else has thought of it. But I've done a few. Yeah, 
So, um, so yeah, so you know, it's, this is the sort just, of thing, just, know, just like just like your squeaky pedal. I'm not going to let on what it is, otherwise the you know the industrial espionage crowd will be, uh, <laughs> yeah, they'll, they'll, be they'll be all over yeah. it. Now. They'll be the all enemy, over yes, the enemy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there are no enemies. <laughs> Um, uh, so yeah, talk, talking on that, yes, we have got dates for next year. Um, I, I'm just waiting on uh, clarification because obviously, because of lockdown, everything is shut down. But it should be in the same place. But it's definitely going to be in Redditch, but hopefully a two to Grange, uh, no problem. And it's the weekend of the bank holiday uh, of uh, February, uh, and it's the 19th, 2021. Uh, it's actually what kind of bank holiday is there in February? February, yeah, February. Bank. What did I say? You said there was a bank holiday. I just said it's because there was a bank holiday. I got so confused. It's like you know, it's like you know, because obviously, apart from it's like I know it's a Saturday because we do this, but it's like oh, it's bank holiday. Oh, it's Monday, and that was yesterday. I got confused with that. Um, yeah. Confused easily these days. Um, but yes, it's like it's the um, it's the half term. I was going to say. It's the uh -huh. half -term. That's the one. The half term, uh, uh, it's like, so it's the, it's the Friday, Saturday, Sunday, the 19th to 21st. It's on the website, cool. um, it's, uh We're not taking money at the moment, because obviously we just we can't guarantee anything. Um, but fingers crossed, that's when it's going to happen um, next year. So, uh, yeah, please bring a diary. Um, so, so, yeah, so, um, so it's, it's the kind of thing where um, uh, if we... If we if we it's like if we if we talking about like you know the 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 networking side of it um, now 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 obviously Daisy and, and Rob know this because obviously you're from that area so like the yeah. Bristol kind of way um, it's it's basically uh, location just key uh, to actually net well, obviously networking it is because obviously you know everyone like, wants to go down to London and all that kind of stuff um, but this is I was, I was one of my teachers told me one day, it's like London's a very big pond with very big fishing. Yeah. Um, mm. um, but it's it's the kind of like the 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 places like Bristol have you know obviously the cracking music scene and very alternative music scenes as well, mm. don't they? It's, do you think it's just like you know? Um, do you think London is now the kind of place where things aren't happening as much and regarding as that kind yeah, of? Yeah, probably. I, I think there are a number of reasons for that. I mean, London has changed so much since since I moved there in the early 1990s um, and a lot of it, chiefly because of the trajectory of the economy over those decades uh, that it's now very very difficult uh, for people for musicians to live in London just cut from uh, from a cost point of view and I know very few musicians uh, amongst my <coughs> my network who actually live in London anymore we all move <laughs> um, on here so just coming back <laughs> and, and but yeah, but for, for the most part, in, in terms of like, you know, I mean, I'm, I, I was living in Battersea up until uh, 2014. That's where I was born. Hey! Yay! Um, and uh, and there were no musicians who lived anywhere near me. They were, they were, everybody was like further out. And, uh, there's lots here now. We're in southeast, mm. so um, we live in Dulwich, and then there's loads in Forest Hill, Catford area, yeah. Hockley. Yeah. New Cross, um, but yeah, I mean, there's the yeah, depends what sort of circles you move in, I suppose. But I um, I've lived here so long that uh, I, we've just got into. I know so many people that are doing really interesting things here. Um, thing about Bristol is that it's just all smaller, so everyone knows everyone, and people are taking more risks. I think musically and stylistically, um, and they're more. They feel maybe happier to say look at this amazing sort of weird music that you know doesn't really fit in these boxes mm. let's play it i think people are more happy to do that there um, but you still get that in london but not maybe not as much and i do i do hear what you're saying about the about changing you know it's, it's different to what it used to be oh really for sure. how, 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 oh, yeah. How do you feel, Rob? Obviously, because you've never, as far as I'm not, you've never lived in London, have you? You've always been where you I don't are. Even know where it is? Now. Where is this London? You where speak? is London? <laughs> London? <laughs> you, 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 you know that. You know that M4. That M4 road. 
Oh, I think I've ended up there a few times. Yeah, the other day. If you, if you keep if you keep going on it, like past Swindon, and... <laughs> you need to get past Swindon. Get over it. Eventually, <laughs> eventually. Is there something past Swindon? I don't think there is. No. <laughs> the only times I go to London, people put a black mask on me and say, "We'll take it off when you get to the other end." And I get there and I don't know where I am. And I go, yeah. "Oh, <laughs> the Empire, Royal Albert Hall. Here we are." I don't know this place. <laughs> um. I, um. You know, people always say to me, you never moved to London, and I didn't. But I know a lot of people that did, um, Matt Sibley, uh, who I think you know, Daisy, and the Hammonds, and people have moved to London. And some stayed, some came back, and it wasn't quite what they wanted. But I remember when I, uh, you know, and they're doing amazingly well now anyway, you know. I mean, would have done anyway if they hadn't have gone anyway. But it's the thing you try. But I, I never did it. And I did a clinic with Ralph Salmons once, and I said, Ralph, is it worth me going to London? And he said why and I said well, well I'm asking you that question <laughs> is it worth me going he said well he said I, I don't I, obviously I didn't know you before but I've checked your CV and you, you're doing quite well and you've been here for how long and I said well did I? and I know so and so people at different students he said why would you want to go to London because you've got to get behind me and thousands of others you know like, why would you do that? you've got a career here and you've got people that you tour with you've got people you've got sessions with you do some teaching you've got everything you need here he said if anything I'm jealous of you having this here and this here yeah environment so he said if I was you Rob I'd say exactly where you are and I thought thanks Ralph I'll do that so I, I, I've years ago when I was a lot younger I probably thought yes maybe I should get in the rat race a bit but um I've been thankful one because of what we said last week practicing learning stuff style blah blah blah, blah networking but also you make some good contacts through that so through people like Charlie we've mentioned already Stuart Bruce is a friend of mine a good producer Steve Osborne all these different people they can connect you up with different projects and uh, as long as your playing's up to it because I also said last week it's all it's all well and good getting the luck but if you turn up at the rehearsal room you can't produce which we all agreed on at the time then you're still no good anyway you know you still have to produce to you know you can live the big lifestyle and talk it but you've got to walk it when you're in the room so I've been very lucky that I'm such an anorak that I work practice all the time to work on that bit um I've been lucky to make some nice connections but I think there's good music going on everywhere um and the internet is actually making that more accessible to more people I think there's good musicians we said Swindon XDC <laughs> you know look at the amount of great musicians who are everywhere and um sure. I don't think you have to go to the big cities anymore to make it no but, not anymore no 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 uh, and i, I think, think everything, that's things are, you know I think everything is much less london centric than it used to be yeah <laughs> i mean many many i'm old enough to remember a time that if you wanted to get to the very top of the ladder as a drummer you either had to go to new york or los angeles and that's not true anymore you can be from anywhere right you can be from anywhere and and you know the the, the, the way society has changed the way uh, access to resources and information has changed. Absolutely. Um, it has made it attainable for, you, know, you, can, you, know, you can be in Austria or Japan or South Korea or yeah, Australia. Yeah. There are great drummers on all continents now, not Absolutely. just confined um, to, to a, a few kind of key hubs of the industry, which still exist, but the, 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 the coming of the, the internet particularly has just opened the whole thing up and it doesn't matter where you live anymore. And I was really worried when I moved out of London. I thought this is going to this could end up going really wrong, but it actually ended up better. Um, primarily because all those out of town gigs where it used to take me an hour or two to get out of London before I got anywhere near a motorway, uh, I can get to in, in, in a fraction of the time now, even though they're, some of them are a bit further away. Yeah. So it's just the practical realities of, 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 of adapting to you know, what the where the modern industry is, um, mm. is and yeah. making that work. Talking about the modern industry, uh, we've got Richard Horton watching. Hi, Rich. How are you doing? Uh, and Mr. Bill Sanders watching. Which ah, is a, Bill. Uh, it's uh, it's obviously hey, um, yeah yeah yeah. Um, yeah Bill, so, right here. Yeah, I'm not using your pad as a as a wine stand. Honestly, I, I'm I'm not using it at all for that. Yeah. So, uh, yes, you are. Yeah. So, um, uh, and, and Glenn, <laughs> uh, Alan as well. Hi, Glenn. Uh, we've we've got a question, uh, which um, 
it's one well the thing is i know we've got three of these players here um it's like it's been uh this is martin again hi martin uh i've been playing for 52 years now and always using match script i'd love to adopt an orthodox script but can't seem to master it always feel awkward any tips or exercises on how to make the transition now i think we have well there's it's many tips and everything else um but um pete you've actually i've noticed was it in your your series uh it, and also if guys if you've not watched um pete's series uh, lockdown licks um it's um it's yeah. very informative bite-sized information but you're on uh season 15 uh, at the moment or something yeah, <laughs> yeah we are yeah, yeah we're, 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 we're 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 up we're up for a, we're up for two emmys now with that yeah so uh, so, so, so it's amazing work he's done uh, literally just yeah, the, crew, the crew here are working so hard to bring those programs to you on a yeah basis. well i think what you'll find is like in a year's time that's basically the picture you'll see of pete you're basically just sitting there uh, <laughs> um, but it's um but you, you, you've actually you've got some sound advice actually on there, and actually you've, you're creating something as well to to help that as well, aren't you? In on on, on YouTube. Well, sorry, sorry. Which thing is that exactly? Are you talking about my new Patreon? Um, That's the one. Yeah, it's, okay. it's, it's coming out, coming on uh, at the end of this month. Yeah, um, I, I was gonna I'd be thinking about doing a, a hand technique DVD because I'm I, I, I obsess over hand technique. And I always have done it. And all my obsession over hand technique has been predicated upon shortcoming, perceived shortcomings in my own playing. And uh, I would think of things that I'd like to be able to do and look at my hands and think, well, why is this not working? And just go back to the drawing board and try and find ways of making these things come right. And uh, I think I probably started to make some serious progress in about 1996 or seven. Um, and that was when I really started to think for myself and, and you know, not reject what I'd learned from various resources previously, but to kind of set that to one side and think, well, you know, I have to do this my way and, uh, and start coming up with some things that are based on what I know, but are, are taking it to a point where I can actually do all these things that I want to do. And, um, and I, I was thinking about doing this as another DVD. But what I'm actually going to do instead uh, is I'm, I'm, I'm doing like two masterclasses a month on Patreon, um, which cost about the same as buying one Costa Coffee latte per week. Uh, works at about 34 pence a day if you subscribe to it. And I'm going to do a complete knockdown drag out on all the things that I've come up with to do with technique that I haven't really seen anywhere else. Uh, and also because, you know, a lot of us, we are, you know, we're doing one-to-one uh, -one online lessons, but you know, that's not affordable for everybody. Most of my students are professional players, and we're all in the same boat. We haven't got any gigs. Our, our, our income has gone down to next to nothing. So instead of charging people my standard hourly rate for a one-to-one -one lesson, I, may, I feel I can deliver something that's much, much more affordable for people, uh, but will have the same kind of um, end result. And, and because it's subscription because I'm in touch with the people who are signing up to it, uh, as well as me kind of um, nominating the direction that the content's going to go. I will take feedback and suggestions from other people. And this is something that I've been kind of trialing with the lockdown next these last few weeks uh, to figure out what people want to know about looking at the, the, the viewing figures and the likes for the various videos that I've done, which is a great way of market research, finding out what people are really interested in. Uh, which is giving me the direction for the subscription channel, which is, which is going through in a couple of weeks' time. Well, well, people, please look at that because Pete's got a wealth of knowledge. Uh, oh, yeah. so, um, without giving anything, so I, I actually started playing that way, uh, and then I went to Match Script because I, I went for very classical. So obviously that is very useful for everything. Um, but um, so timpani grip, you know, German. Um, so it's obviously French and German. I play slightly halfway between. I call it Luxembourg. Um, thank you. Um, um, oh, hang on, hang on. Yeah, yeah. I'm here all week. Uh, uh, well, uh, 
<laughs> but um, but when I went back to um, when I was actually doing my uh, recital for my postgraduate diploma, um, wonderful teacher I had, uh, Malcolm Garrett. What a wonderful player he is as well. Um, I basically started oh, okay. with the technique and and for doing stick, I was basically just had a snare drum and I was doing all the stick trickery and all this kind of you know fancy stuff, balancing with my tongue and you know, well, did, 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 did. you can't do that match grip. Um, and the one bit of advice he basically you know was ironed it down is that um he said right shake my hand with your left hand and he said stop and basically that was the shape basically sort of makes it comes in that's where i do see a lot of people um basically it's, it's in this guy it's really bent yeah, yeah, yeah. trying to do yeah, here um so because you, you've got no you've got nothing to manipulate you know whole kind of thing you know you want you want wrist you want arm you can manipulate your fingers and everything else so the only thing i would say you know straight away obviously pete's the master um you know 32, well, 34 pence a day, did you say? We've worked out about that, yeah. It's, it's, uh, it's $12.50 a month. It's well, the thing is, so, 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 you know, we're not spending stuff on haircuts, are we? You know, to me, you can see this. Do um, <laughs> you know what I mean? So, so spend your money on basically going to see Pete, you know. Um, but, yeah, but that's that's the one thing. So, so Martin, if, if you just do look, I do see a lot of people, basically, they're really, really flat and basically open because if you think about it, you've twisted there. What, what, what this can't do anything now uh, and that's most probably where it feels awkward and everything comes in and you know and, and also the, the angle you snare drum have a look at that but it, we, we can talk about fractured ages but um one of the places obviously you know um you know on pete's uh it's, it's really going to be on your youtube channel isn't it uh there's links to it on there certainly the best way to find it is it's, it's i guess through my facebook or youtube or instagram there um, we are okay here's, here's, uh, a, here's, a, here's a quick trailer um Everybody thinks that traditional grip is all based upon this, this thumb and index finger thing. Like that. It isn't. There we go. That's the trailer. That's the trailer. <laughs> that is like that is like maybe fifteen to twenty percent of it. Wait, there there is a whole world of traditional grip out there that uh, uh, people just haven't. I don't know even thought about it yet. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, coming to where it's theatre in you. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, uh, oh hi Paul Edwins, uh, hi Sharon, uh, and a few others. Basically watching, fantastic. Um, so, but switch between those magic whatever feels comfortable now. Sometimes for so many. Yeah, good advice, good advice, Kenneth. Um, uh, Rob is, seems to be running off again. Um, he's going to get his garlic. Um, I've got one from Elliot Scott. I start off with rudimental drumming from day one, and it's far more natural to me than match grip. I just thought, just through practice, I played at the Palace Drum Club in Percussion Theatre a while back. You did, didn't you? Uh, and obviously, from that kind of stuff, you know, you do have to, you know, it's there. But um, uh, see if I get a response from you, Elliot. Do, do you find, actually, because obviously your snare drums are very, very flat. Um, you know, I tend to have mine angled because obviously the angle that you are. Um, do you actually find there's any kind of, uh, I don't know, do you struggle any pain or anything to it in, in that arm or because your muscles are tra trained that way? Because uh, I know a lot of guys who play drummers that way, uh, who play match grip, sometimes they actually they, they swatch uh, between traditional match, you know, because it's quite simple. You know, I struggle sometimes. I've actually flattened my snare drum out a few occasions because, I can't basically do something, maybe cross sticks my elbows. I mean, I can't do, you know, you know, all that kind of stuff. So it'd be interesting to come back at it to see if, um, you know, you, your advice, um, yeah, rudimental drumming, uh, I'm, all, I'm all for that and everybody knows me about it. But it's, um, yeah, do you, um, do you find this like the, the actual angle of your drum um, a disadvantage or advantage, or is it just because you've been playing it so long it becomes natural? Um, it's just one, well, my personal, I always want to like to know, but. Um, so yeah, so it's it's all good. Um, some people, oh, it's come back, fantastic. Some people do just because of the head tension. There we go. So it's, it's that kind of thing. But obviously, if you if you play on a on a, a practice pad, uh, like dear old Bill's, obviously watching, um, that that may resolve the problem. Um, but it's it's it's, it's an interesting one. So it's like. Um, when you have, so you know, the, I, I've, I'm a very rudimental drummer, and I practice my rudiments. So I've been displacing my rudiments, you know, putting the, the accents or sort of the flams in different parts of the site so um, rudiment now. So, you know, because that's what I've been working on quite a lot. Then transfer them to the kit and see what you know producers out of that, and you know, be comfortable in what you're doing. Um, but we, we we talk about rudiments all, all the time, but. Is it a, an advantage um, or a disadvantage, um, basically not knowing your rudiments? Daisy, 
Because I can remember when you came, uh, it was only in January, so I got, yeah. um, I haven't slept since then, but I can remember. Um, it's, uh, you, you did say to me, it's like, you know, because obviously the technical side, because you said, you know, you know, you can see basically, like, you know, I work on my hands and everything else. Um, and you did ask me the question, does it actually free myself up for creativity? Yeah, I was just wondering if it came from the same sort of part of your brain. Um, well, 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 it, it, it it doesn't really, because the creativity for me comes from, uh, it's, it's in the forefront, I suppose, in my mind. Mm. And then it's like the, the tools to be creative are basically at the backs, because that's yeah. what I basically worked out and put them in there. But mm. do you find, because you're, uh, it, it, this is, again, this is my personal opinion. You are most probably one of the best groovers uh, around at the moment. You can just sit and you just groove all day long it feels you know you shut your eyes and it just feels good it just feels fantastic just to see you just place you just sitting down and just laying it out you obviously you're playing simple rudiments just like singles and double strokes and all kind of stuff but are you consciously aware of um it's like the rudimental side of your playing at all or is there a rudimental side to your playing well there there was because i learned them all um and then i did grades and then i went to university and played in orchestras for years and did classical degree um, and all of that. So, but at some point, uh, well, actually, I think from very from very early on, they 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 weren't connected in my brain. So connect like creativity is sort of over here, and uh, the technique and everything is quite actually for me quite separate. Right. So I would I would just have an idea and then I'd figure out a way to play it without you know thinking about if it is it a rough is it a drag is it a flam or it's this 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 mm. with the accent here 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 i just don't think like that um so yeah for me that's why it's so interesting that's why i asked you because you were yeah. it obviously worked out this way you're using moella also to get over an injury that you had yeah i actually had tender night well i suppose i still have yeah. but it's yeah, in this yeah so that yeah. obviously yeah. makes perfect sense as you're trying to get back to to it feeling completely normal again and um yeah I just thought it was so it was so interesting and yeah we're, we're, we think about those things maybe quite differently um mm. but because um, I think it's safe to say oh Dave Lebson's come on uh hi Daisy hi Dave um hope you're doing well I hope you're practicing your bass um Matthew <laughs> Devilish hi hi Matthew um oh, Matthew. It is, it, I think it's for all of us that we don't actually, when we're playing stuff, we actually don't think, oh, it's that room or it's that kind of, because I think it's, because we've had that kind of uh, mentality of sitting down and learning this stuff, you know, because mm -hmm. obviously that, that's why, you know, why can you sit down and group well, because you can basically, it's, it's there, you've been practicing that for absolutely hours mm -hmm. on end, you know, it's like, or you basically do that little feel because you've been doing that, it's like, you know, why can you lead with your left hand? Well, I practice left hand, it's like left hand every other month kind of thing, I have to do it on left, you know, it's all that kind of stuff. Do we find now that kind of, we don't have to worry about what actually we have to play, because it's just organically there? Well, I think it's like learning a language. I mean, you think about how you learn to speak. Mm. Uh, you learn to speak by repeating phrases that you hear mm. and then you go to school and you get taught to read words and, and you get taught arithmetic and your mm. times tables uh, if you had a certain kind of education I don't know whether it's quite so prevalent today I know you're wrong um, and as you become uh, better acquainted and more dexterous with the language you begin to create things in your own way based on your knowledge of the mechanics and the techniques of the language. Yeah, so you almost you imagine, rudiments. Yeah, can you imagine if if everything you ever spoke, uh, the only phrases that you could open your mouth and speak, the phrases you you heard somewhere else, and mm -hmm. so many players play that way. They just yeah, play yeah. stuff that they, you know. It, I, I do this on clinics. So I'll, I'll, I'll I'll say a phrase in German, and the one I usually use is "Wie kommt die Schambeste zum uh, which means which is the best way to the town hall, please. And if you're in Germany and <laughs> like you want to know the way to German the want, want to know the way to the town hall, that is the best thing you could possibly say. But Practice. if you're in Italy <laughs> and you want to buy a kilo of asparagus, you're wasting your time. <laughs> so don't treat music in the same way that people do. They will, you know, they will rope down these little phrases, and it becomes like a, you know, like a Berlitz 
you know, Berlitz Guide to Jazz Drumming, you know, uh, da, 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 or whatever. And, and they'll take these little phrases and, and learn them like piecemeal and try to put them into music. And that's not how it works. Mm. Not, you know, that, that will not get you past a certain level of attainment. And, yeah. um, you know, you, the more fluency, people talk about flow. I was, I was on this on, on, online the other day. People talk about flow. Flow is fluency. Flow is just one of those buzzwords at the moment where drums are concerned. Flow is about having fluency, about your ideas and your technique being so finely balanced mm -hmm. that they will serve one another perfect. Because if you've got all the technique and no ideas, then <laughs> I could say it won't. Um, <laughs> if, you, if you've got loads of creativity but no facility, then you know, you know, neither one of those is going <laughs> to bring about this, this mythical buzzword of our times, which is flow. As I say, I prefer to call it fluency. Fluency is the perfect balance of technical facility and, and creativity. Mm. Um, and it's, yeah. it's a language. It's a language. You know, you Brilliantly said. Yeah. Yeah. No, we've, sure. um, we've got, a, it's, I suppose it's a statement, I suppose, um, from Jim Ferry. Why do we English even have to com have this conversation about rudiments as being helpful for developing vocabulary? The Americans take it for granted, like pianists take playing scales and arpeggios. Uh, in in UK education culture, is the fundamental problem at the bottom of all of this. So, well, it's well, I suppose you know. So like, yeah, you know, for, for me, it's it's you know, it doesn't matter what you're doing, you're still playing rudiments. So you, for me, I you know, I know my rudiments back to front, you know, upside down, all kind of stuff. But that's you know, it's me, and I teach that way as well. You know, I teach them, you know, the most useful ones first, and then we have fun with all the other ones like I don't know what the last time I actually played um a patter flafla in, in a gig. Um first of all I love saying patter flafla. Um, I, yeah. I can't even say it. Then we won't play it. Oh, <laughs> um, uh, anyway, oh right here we have we have the Alan Dawson rudimental ritual right here. <laughs> <laughs> um but yeah oh, I, got it, I got it right here. Uh, I don't know. I wonder if I can even play this thing. Go on, here we go. Here we go. <laughs> PK, I won't go drum roll. I was going to say drum roll. Oh, beautiful. You can. There we go. Basically, yeah. Standard of um, uh, utter mediocrity. Um, <laughs> But, uh, you, you know, do you know what I think about rudiments? Rudiments are, are a way of, you know, in, particularly in the, you know, the young players starting out. They're a bit like that, you know, when your mum and dad would put like a height chart on the kitchen wall and tell you like, yeah. you are, you, you're 98 centimetres tall. And then a few weeks later, you are uh, one metre and two centimetres tall. <laughs> rudiments are a great way of charting your progress as a player. Mm. You know, if you couldn't play a flam accent a week ago, now you can. You're a better player than you were a week ago, but it's where you take the language and what you end up doing. Yeah, it. yeah, yeah. really, the, the the at the core of, of what yeah. where we're trying to go. Mm -mm. Yeah, well, Elliot Scott's come back. It says, um, as a rudimentalist, Pete's fluency is the perfect description. I've seen plenty of technicians in the U.S. without the creative side. I've seen yeah. far more creative. Totally agree. Totally agree. Yeah, creativity in the Bristol scene without the rudimental prowess. But if you've got both, you'll kill it. Totally, every time. So there Hang we are. On. Yeah. Spot on. Yeah, it's just, it's like a you know it's, you know Pete saying our, our our dear friend Gary. I uh, hope Gary's watching. Um, I actually managed to get him actually onto onto Facebook via his wife. But um, we, we've um, yeah, when he used to teach, because obviously, you know, there used to be only 26 rudiments, uh, the Coast of Us own rudiments, um, before it sort of expanded to 40. Uh, and he used, when he was starting, he was teaching, he said, well, there's 26 letters of the alphabet. You need D-O-G to spell dog. You need that, that, and that to play. Do you know what I mean? It's, if, you've, if you've got that vocabulary to start with, you don't have to then spew, go, oh, it's, you know, because the creativity then comes from that. Um, that's like what, what I've been doing um, just in the past, just the last couple of weeks. Um, it's the power diddle grid. So basically, you put the X on the pa, then you play it for X amount of time, then you put it on the ra, then you put it on the, do you know what I mean? So on the did and the door. And then, so, you know, you're doing that all day long. It's like, you know, but 
in, if, if anyone came to the camp uh, um, in one of my sessions, um, that, that's like about practice ball and stuff like that, I, I created this, um, where's mine, I'll show you, I created this thing called the, the practice attitude, um, when you sit down and actually practice, um, hopefully that might not come backwards, so the practice attitude um, is the, the concept, so you know, when you sit down and practice, and then inside of that bubble is what people do not see, and the outside is what people do see, uh, and in there it's like, you know, for, you know, for myself, you know, uh, you know, I, I came up with this word accidentally, but it makes perfect sense. Like concentration, you know, if if you're doing something, you know, you need to concentrate on your counting, especially if you're just laying it down. You need to be focused. You know, you've got things going on. You know, you need to know where you actually are in the bar and stuff like that. So you, you, the concentration. Uh, the, and my three P's theory: the purpose of practice is to progress. So if you're sitting there basically practicing, uh, and it's like you end the session, you go. Well, what have I actually physically done, apart from basically maybe shred or something like that? There was no purpose to it. If you purpose to sit down and have a good time, it's absolutely fine. But if you sit there to practice, so what's the purpose? So three Ps, the purpose to practice to progress. Take the progress out of it. What was the purpose to practice? You know, stuff like that, you know, um, practice makes my, you know, everyone says, perfect. It doesn't, guys. I'm sorry. Practice it. It makes permanent. If you permanently practice something uh, correctly, it becomes perfection. You know, but obviously there's a lot, you know, to go on with that. Yeah, you know, that's, so, a big, that's a big if, though, isn't it? That's a it really is a big, big if, if, yeah. Um, so, so this is kind of thing. So, with with, with all this kind of stuff, um, I've got I've got people to put why why are we actually doing what we're doing. So, when I come down to that one, my purpose was why to see basically how I'm playing actually the kit. And it, it cropped something up, basically. Uh, it's almost like the, the Joe Morello doubles when you basically start doing the doubles on the on the diddle. Um, but then it reversed it on the dual. So when you had that accent right the, on the fourth uh, of the power of diddle, uh, you had to literally go that way and basically going up that way. And then it feels nice now after playing it for you know a few hours and everything else. Mm. And it's something that I didn't think about before. So when I basically play out, you know, I can literally come, whoops, but you can do that. and. For me, practicing all these, then you put onto there, something then starts to happen. I can do that now, because I literally sat down and done that. The next development stage of it, do you know what I mean? It's just all, why do we do it? Well, to discover what we can and can't do, I suppose, at the end of the day. So, you know, when we're practicing, I always say to myself, why am I doing this? Whether it's rudimental stuff or that. So, but for me, the rudiments basically lead on to other stuff. It's the creativity. I've, I've got, as I say to one of my students, like, I'm giving the tools in the toolbox you're going to get full toolbox, hopefully use them, you know, so, you know, you don't want a rusty spanner, that will be nice and clean when it comes out of the box, you know, so, um, so, so it's all that kind of stuff, so I've, I've rambled on, I, you know, sorry about that, I, I had a moment there, I went on with a bit. It's all good, it's all good. Yeah, um, so, uh, Jim, come out, um, yeah, so it's, like, it's, 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 it's another statement here from from uh, from Jim. It's like, and then kids don't have any opportunity to play with human beings at school. Practicing rudiments in the UK is like learning German grammar. They're never soaking German. Peer groups don't exist. They're not institutionalized. Private teachers can only do so much. Measuring your progress as a ten-year-old and and the only musician you know is your teacher is a nightmare. Technical facility plus creativity will always be sort of the pinnacle. You know, so so well, yeah. Um, I suppose you know. It's, it's, I suppose this is, is another day talking about sort of the education system. Um, you know, there's there's teachers out there for everybody, but um, I suppose it's like you guys, like you know, you've obviously had some fantastic influences. You know, because the teacher not necessarily can you know sit down and sort of teach you, you know, what you do in your hands, what your feet, what you're actually sort of reading on the chart. So they can be influences. Um, you know, it's like you know having teachings from such and such. I, mean, I suppose uh, if we trying to sort of hit on it, so like, you know, people sort of follow sort of practice of Buddha. Never have met Buddha, but they, they, they follow the practice, um, you know. But it's, um, I suppose it's one of those things where, you know, it's it's hard, but we, I suppose at the end of the day, you've got to be happy, you know. It's, I've always said, if you're not having fun, don't do it. In any form of life. So I suppose it's, it's music as well. If you're not having fun with your music, then what, why are you doing it? You know, so what, why, why are the kids... Oh. Learning and stuff. I, 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 I've been there uh, uh, to earn a living. Uh, I, I learned a long time ago that I couldn't necessarily, I, I, I touched on this earlier on, but I couldn't necessarily play what I wanted to all the time. Um, and that I, you know, do in order to maximize, you know, to pay my bills and, and make headway as a professional musician, 
I had to be as flexible as I could be and, and be prepared to take on all kinds of work, some of which I didn't particularly enjoy doing. But, you know, mm. I was a, a new face in London in the early 90s, and, and, and it was what had to be done. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah definitely. I, I suppose, um, uh, Rob, I'll, I'll come to you this one, and then um, just conscious of time, because we've, uh, we've, again, we've, we can talk for hours, guys. Thank you very much for watching. Um, <laughs> I suppose it's, it's the same old thing. It always keeps coming back, whether, you know, we're, you know, we class ourselves. I went through a stage a couple of years ago. I had to say to myself, you know, actually, what is, what is my job? And I actually have to say that I'm an entertainer because without an audience, what would I actually be doing? And then I'm a musician and then I'm a drummer. So it's third down the list. So it's the music, music side that always keeps coming, doesn't it? Or it's always there, whatever, whatever you're doing, whatever, you know, which instrument you play. Because I know a lot of people who play fantastic, but um, they, where's the musicality? Um, yeah. Is there, is there any advice that you could basically give to, I suppose, anybody in any kind of situation? You know, teachers, um, you know, people playing, that kind of stuff. You know, how do you play music? It's a well, big subject, but, you know, can you... I, I mean, that's a, it's a huge church, yeah. that one. that's so broad. Um, but I, I think for the people learning the material, also for students uh, of any age learning, um, as, we, as we've already said, it's a language. It's a language, your learning styles, it's all language. And after that, it's up to you to do something with it. Um, and you can borrow from other people, but eventually you have to start talking for yourself. Um, and it's okay, you know, if someone comes up to you and says, how do you feel about such and such a drummer? If you don't feel it, don't feel you have to say you like them because it's oh, what people should that, say, you know. And, that old and, yeah, you, you yeah. Know, yeah, you have to speak your own language. I mean, there are sometimes people say to me, what do you think of Steve Gadd? And I say, he's amazing, but would I listen to him? Not all the time, but... <laughs> If I'm on a session where someone says it's this feel, I go, I know which Gad album that's on because I've got the records. But do I listen to him to excite me sometimes? Not particularly. And people go, you can't say that, it's Steve Gad. And I say, well, no, I can say that because he's not my first go-to drummer to excite me. But yeah. when I want him to show me something that is seems incredibly simple, but he does it the best in the world, then I'll go to Steve Gad. And I think for me, that's one of the highest things you can say of any drummer. You go to seek them for the knowledge. But would I put him on now if after this after this thing? No, I probably wouldn't. I'd probably put on whoever, you know, Ringo Starr even, bless him, even though he screwed up Ludwig drum. But um, and for teachers, I think it's really important to, you know, some guys, I know some guys are so into the syllabus, that's all we see, syllabus, 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 next pupil, syllabus, syllabus, next pupil, you know, and it's hard for them, and I understand that, but still try and keep that little feeling they had when they first played the drums, that excitement right, when they first yeah. played something. Why, what, yeah, what, what was it that um, inspires you in the first place? Exactly. You've got, to, you've got to stay in touch with that. I mean, I, I'm... I consider myself very fortunate that you know whatever I may or may not have done, I am exactly the drummer I wanted to be when I was six years old. And, you know, between the letter. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. The, 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 may, maybe a bit more money would have been nice, but uh, <laughs> well, in, yeah, terms, for in, in terms of in terms of you know playing and and genre and, and attainment um, and, and and kind of you know, point of view attitude, uh, I, I have set out to do exactly what I was going for. But that doesn't mean I'm, anywhere, I'm ever going to finish it. If not, never. <laughs> uh, Daisy? Um, yeah, I mean, it's all been said already, really. But I, I think I'm always trying to get back to that point where it um, feels like true expression. Um, or, yeah, that, that very just almost naive feeling. Mm that you had when you, you just started you just started playing and that's kind of how I approach everything it's I don't want to do it unless it's like either someone that I really really love their music or really really dig what what the, the meaning that they're trying to purvey mm -hmm. um and then it means something you know um if it's not my own band then they have they really have to be some someone that I really want to work with these days so um like like Paloma's brilliant because she has such good messages for for she's a brilliant role model for for young women and 
Um, she's really hot on climate and just really outspoken on, on all really major issues at the moment. Um, so she's a sort of holistic, sort of really brilliant artist that I like to work with. But And then when we all play together, it's really means something. And I do sort of go back to it because the tunes are so good and bang it. And you just sort of go back to that point where you just feel like this is amazing, you know. Mm. They're lucky. Uh, Play these drums. <laughs> uh, well, a bit, bit conscious time. Uh, Matthew uh, Devon has, has asked a question. Now, can I ask Matthew, can you ask that question next week and I'll explain why? Um, but please hold on that question, but please ask that next week. Um, f for me, um, I, now, during obviously these this lockdown periods, obviously it's been, we were talking about this earlier uh, off, off camera. Um, that it's been absolutely fantastic having this downtime because we've actually got back to some, well, for me, I've actually got back enjoying my playing um, because, you know, I've, I've been working stuff. And uh, the other day um, I got, I had, I had a new delivery. My signature sticks come through. And it's just like, <laughs> I don't need these now at the moment. <laughs> I get to pair up and it's like, you know, it's this new car smells. You've got brand new sticks in your hand. And I just, you know, I, I had a little bit of a kind of slight, the day before and I always make sure I work through the kind of the down days when just everything's not going right it's just like well what I could do that yesterday do you know what I mean so that kind of thing. because I know at the end of the next day it's going to be absolutely fine and you, you worry about nothing um but that day I put this new pair of sticks out and I sat down and I was playing and I was, I just I enjoyed myself again actually playing the drums mm -hmm. and I think one of these things that um during during lockdown is that it's actually given us that kind of time to actually I think appreciate uh, actually what 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 we have as as musicians, as entertainers, as, as drummers, you know. Because you know, for me, um, I don't need a band to play music. Um, it's all in here, and I can just basically, um, you know, basically almost regurgitate it, like like I suppose like like a cow chewing the cud, um, bring it back up, and basically just spurt it out on, onto the kit and. It's been very much of enjoyment, so uh, I, I'm actually quite thankful. I'm quite a positive person anyway in this kind of sense, but quite thankful that we actually have got this time. We actually sit down and actually enjoy yourselves again, actually doing what you love and finding it's really, it's really in love with find, it. find positivity in this and, uh, and, and you know, get, get value out of it, uh, which yeah. is why I started doing my video blog, just to you know, give me a sense of purpose and, yeah. and, and something to do and think about on a daily basis rather than. Mm -hmm. Sitting here and, and, and letting, letting the, the, the dust settle on. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, it, it's it's a blessing in disguise. It's very heavily disguised, but it is a blessing in disguise. Yeah. And I, 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 I keep meaning to uh, get myself uh, some signature sticks to my own. Uh, but in order to do that, I'm going to have to change my name by default to Five A. <laughs> 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 well, you know, it's, um, if anyone's going to do it, you can do it, Pete. Yeah. Um, so. uh, the, wait, what is this? Uh, oh, sorry. I, I, uh, these are pretty worn out. I thought it said Cater. It actually says Vator on them. Oh, <laughs> just one, 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 one consonant away with all at once. Yeah. Um, okay, guys. Uh, I'll say thank you so much for watching. Um, Thank you very much, uh, our panelists, Pete and Pete and Rob. You'll be back next week. Daisy, um, what are you Daisy. working? What are you working on at the moment? Because obviously, thank you very much for being our special guest, and I hope you enjoyed it. Um, you know, being on, we, we, we've we've loved having you. I know, I, I know, I, I love spending so talking to you anyway. Yeah, we could talk for hours, can't we? But it's lovely to meet you, Pete and Rob. Yeah, you too, Daisy. Thank you guys. So, so is, is there anything you've been basically like working on during this time where we can't work? <laughs> Yeah, well, we've been, uh, I told you before, but we were, we, my band, Feverus, have been making the soundtrack for the Peaky Blinders video game, uh, which is out in the summer. Um, we were in the studio from pretty much the 1st of January um, making it. Um, and then lockdown came and we had to stop, basically, but we did deliver, like, what they needed for the, for the game already. So that's pretty cool. That's going ahead. Um, so yeah, we've just been working on some uh, release plans for getting getting the songs out, sort of feverish side. And um, I've I have a label um, called Baby Legs Records um, with my band Mesodorm, and we're going to be releasing something soon as well. So I'm doing lots of sort of admin and managing 
things and PR sort of from home basically but I've been doing that for a few years so so um, busy, busy times at the moment yeah so day to day hasn't really changed that much it's just the gigs that have um disappeared and uh, but we're starting back in the studio next week actually uh it's a big studio so we're sort of <laughs> two meters apart um so yeah we 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 can finish that album that soundtrack album which will be available with that game in the summer Fantastic. Well, thanks so much, guys. Uh, you at home, uh, if, if you are watching from anywhere, you know, keep keeping informed uh, on the Facebook page, Palace Drum Clinic, uh, and obviously the website. There's plenty of stuff, information on the website. Um, look out for um, our PD countdown. Um, you'll see Daisy Palmer very soon on one of those. You just saw Rob um, this week. If you haven't watched it, it's quite a fun one. And Pete kicked it off a couple of weeks ago. Um, so it's been all very, very good. So thanks so much to say. Thank you very much for your, your questions. Please keep coming in. Uh, next week, um, we're same panel back again. Uh, but our special guest next week is um, Gabor Dorne. Um, so Matthew, definitely your question about slight polyrhythms of feet and hands and all kind of stuff. He's one of your men to actually ask. So that's why I say save it for next next week so uh, Gabo will be joining us um, next week uh, as our special guest um, but it's um, delight to have Daisy back on thank you very so much um, you take time now and uh, just keep doing what you're doing um, and just keep safe um, and thank you Pete and Rob and I'll see you guys next week anyway you, you know, can't get rid of you guys um, but yeah PunishDramClinic.com, have a look. Um, if you are watching on uh, repeat, please hashtag re uh, replay. Um, and also it will be on uh, the YouTube channel, my YouTube channel, uh, find me Matt Green Drums, uh, mail at mattgreen.org.uk um, on, on YouTube 24 hours after after we finish. So thanks so much, guys. Thanks, Daisy. Thanks, Pete. Thanks, Rob. Uh, take care yourselves, everyone. And we'll see you all very soon next week. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.